Once again, we present Departure Lounge, where people who are leaving this country, sometimes for very personal reasons, sometimes for good, tell us why. Miss Andre Melly. There can't be many people viewing this evening who don't know the name Mervyn Craddy. <laughs> Pilloried in the press, shunned by society, he has been obliged to leave the country. But how is it that a man, young, intelligent, good-looking and talented, <laughs> finds himself in this position? Well, it's a bit sordid. <laughs> That's all right, I understand. <laughs> well, you see, <clears throat> it all started for me about five years ago. I remember it quite well because it was the day after my 21st birthday party. And me and my friend Mark, who's a very kind, considerate, and warm-hearted property developer, <coughs> went for a stroll up in Soho. All we wanted was the breath of fresh air. I mean, it was all quite innocent. At what time was this? Three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> we passed an establishment called the Sexy Erotica Playgirl Club. A blonde stood in the doorway with heavily massacred eyeballs. <coughs> A low-cut blouse barely concealing her ample portions. Ample pr pr proportions. Hello, sailor, she quilped. Come inside. The place is full of fun-loving girls. Thinking only to have a cup of tea and perhaps a Manchester tart. <coughs> and perhaps a quick 50 up on the dartboard. Me and my friend went inside, but inside it was like a den of inequality. It was like the Tower of Barbell. It was like that film about Gomorrah and that other place. Sodom. Anyway, a lady walked towards me. She was carrying a whip and wore a fireman's helmet, bus driver's overcoat, tram driver's gloves, a, rob a rubber body belt. <laughs> and clogs. She asked me if I was interested in a special service. What did you say? I said I wasn't very religious. It was then that you met this musician, Sarah. Yes, yeah, she had arrived to take part in an all-night jam session, and I helped her unpack her cello. <laughs> I sat there and watched her all night, absolutely enthralled. She played it side saddle. <laughs> I thought it was very courageous, without spurs. Uh, that's how it all started. Yes, one night, <clears throat> I went to a party. It was a surprise party. Well, it was for me, anyway. <laughs> It was given by the second banjo player of the London Sympathy Orchestra. My head, dizzy with champagne and ruby-type Algerian South African port-style empire wine, I inadvertently and rather foolishly fondled one of Ivy Benson's. One of Ivy Benson's? Musicians. The trombone player. I'd never been close to a trombone player before. I mean, it's not like a trumpet player or a French horn. Mm. They have bigger embouchures. <laughs> Perhaps that's got something to do with it. I, don't know. But I just knew that from that moment on, I was going to be a croupier. A groupie. A groupie. Well, isn't that someone who offers their favours to pop stars? Yes, I just couldn't help myself. They used to draw me just like a maggot. I mean, go on. Well, you see, one night I went to see the Updike Ladies Colliery Band. They was playing for the Chalfont St Giles, old age pensioners all nude limbo dance team. <laughs> I remember it very well because I had to lower the loo doors. Because some of them was getting in free. So. <laughs> anyway, there I was outside the stage door of the Broadbent Hall, with my ballpoint in my hand, when I was set upon by a gang of girls on motorbikes, all wearing leather gear. And they was like hooligans they was. They all come after me and, and I was for the first time, and I hope it never happens again, victim of a gangplank. A gangplank? A gangbang! <laughs> you mean uh, all these girls uh, uh, had their way with you? All except the little fat one. <laughs> Why was that? I didn't fancy her. And after that, I like, 
I, I, I come back to town. With your tail between your legs. <laughs> Where else? <laughs> It was then that you became... Um... Yes, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I became a call boy. I'm not afraid of it. I came from a home for unmarried fathers, remember? I mean, at least... <laughs> at least I was a high-class call boy. You don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like to be young and attractive. Every night outside the stage door, they was waiting for me, duchesses and hairlesses. Hairlesses. <laughs> And lady TV producers with tempting offers, all looking at me and bearing me in mind. And uh, one of them was, of course, a member of the government. That's quite right. The Minister for Underworld Affairs. The Under Minister for World Affairs. Lady Porker. Was there ever anything between you? Not very often. <laughs> What happened? Well, then you see this chap from the Sunday newspaper got hold of me and he wanted me to take sort of photographs of her and compromising positions and that, you know, with my Polaroid. <laughs> and to, like, take down everything what she said, like all the words she spoke in that, you know. Uh, but surely it was your word against hers. No, no, you see, because he had furnished me with a miniature tape recorder, what I had secreted about my person. <laughs> and so everything she said, I got down, she couldn't argue against that, could she? Uh, and um, that escapade in the nudist camp. <laughs> oh, I showed him a thing or two there. I? <laughs> I mean, I exposed every, every... See, I had to pretend to be one of them. Not one, not one of the, one of the, I had to go along like a nudist and that. You had to be nude and everything, but I got it down every word she spoke. <laughs> but if you were nude, how did you record all those confessions of hers? With great difficulty. <laughs> and not a little discomfiture. <laughs> but I hasten to add, we was never romantically attached. It was nothing like that. Oh, no, 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 we was, we, we was only good friends, only good friends. Now I find that very hard to believe. I mean, you are very attractive. I know. <laughs> But just the same, whenever she got, like, a bit fruity or anything like that, you know, I used to put a knockout drop in her cocoa. She used to go, spark out, out like a light. <laughs> Didn't you feel guilty? Only once. <laughs> when was that? When she asked for a second cup. <laughs> and now, with public opinion so very much against you, you are having to leave the country. That's quite right. I'm going to Spain. Uh, how will you manage? Well, that should be all right. You know, I got the yacht and the villa that Lady Porker bought me and the 40,000 quid I got from the newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> Won't you be lonely? I shouldn't think so. You ready, girls? <laughs> Come on, oh, Dubs. Here we are. Right. <laughs> I hope the plane doesn't go without you. <laughs> I shouldn't think so. I only bought it this morning. <laughs> I say, Trapshaw, give it a kick. Get it started, will you? Off we go. <laughs> that sad story of a boy who went wrong, I must say good night and cycle back to town. <laughs>